Welcome. Welcome, everyone. We're so excited to have you here at the Ladies Who Launch Pathways to Capital Summit. My name is Sarah Fryer. I'm a co-founder of Ladies Who Launch and CEO of Nextdoor. And whether you're joining us from San Francisco, from Belfast, my hometown, Auckland, New Zealand, um, so many places around the world, we are thrilled to have you with us. Uh, quick PSA, there is closed captioning on to provide accessibility. So if you need it and would like to have it, just click on the CC button on the bottom of your screen. For those of you who are new to the Ladies Who Launch community, we're a nonprofit organization that supports women and non-binary business owners and entrepreneurs around the globe to help them scale and sustain all of your amazing businesses. We provide inspiration, education, funding, and critical networking and community all for free. Yeah, it's free, ladies. Come on in. There's no catches. We are here for you. We have your back. Um, we're excited to get people back in person, although we weren't quite ready for it with this summit. So thank you for bearing with us in yet another virtual environment. Um, we know it's been tough, but we will be back hopefully later in the year with some in-person conferences as well. Um, as a community, we know that you've faced a lot of significant barriers to accessing funding and financing. And we know that COVID has in some ways only made that worse. And yet we need to get to a point where women don't just have a level playing field. We're actually trying to get to the point where women and non-binary founders have a competitive advantage in all of this. And that's what we're hoping you're going to get some great advice on today. So whether you're bootstrapping, maybe you're tapping into friends and family, maybe you're going to those first angel investors, maybe you're getting super sophisticated and heading towards venture capital funding, there's a whole series of incredible options between here and the end of day. Um, you'll also get to hear from folks like Administrator Guzman, who's the head of the SBA here in the United States. Um, really tune in for that one. SBA has an amazing um, profile and can go from lending through to investment capital. But to get us started, because you need to start strong, I'm so thrilled and grateful to welcome Catherine Finney, a pioneering entrepreneur, an investor, a funder of entrepreneurs and business owners, and a true visionary who's charted her own pathway and will inspire you to continue to do the same. Let me give you a quick bit about Catherine, and then most importantly, we're just going to hear from her. So she is the founder and managing general partner of Genius Guild, a venture studio with a $20 million venture fund that builds and invests in scalable companies led by black founders that serve their communities and beyond. Catherine invests in market-based innovations designed and racism. We could not be more have your back, Catherine, because it's so important in this world today. She's also the founder of the Dooney Fund, supporting over 2,000 Black women entrepreneurs throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Um, she's a well-known founder and past CEO of Digital Undivided, a groundbreaking social enterprise focused on creating a world where women own their work. She started Digital Undivided after selling her company, The Budget Fashionista, a lifestyle media company, making her one of the first Black women to have a really successful startup exit. And then finally, and there's more, it's hard to believe, isn't it? She has a new book coming out called Build the Damn Thing, How to Start a Successful Business if You're Not a Rich White Guy. I love that. Go for it. Um, it's slated to launch this summer, summer of 2022, under the Penguin Random House portfolio in print. You can catch her podcast, also called Build the Damn Thing, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts where she shares the narrative of her journey and storied career as an entrepreneur, how she's an inclusion champion, an investor to encourage black founders, um, and really help all pursue their entrepreneurial dreams. And that's why she's here today. Catherine, we're so excited that you're joining us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to speak with you today. Yeah, what a what a background. Um, and I will tell you in the side room before we started, Catherine was even giving us top tips on her amazing eyewear. So I can understand where the budget is <laughs> Jean, it's still strong in this one. Yes. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit more. Let's start there. Let's start with Budget Fashionista. Um, it became one of the most successful blogs of all time with seven figure revenue numbers. Pretty darn impressive. And it put you on the map as a startup funder. So tell us a little bit more about some of the lessons you learned and then, you know, take us to the end of that journey because you decided to sell it. And so even for our founders who are listening today, 
they're in all sorts of places of their startup journey. So maybe talk us through that arc. Yeah, so I started the Budget Fashionista um, because I was I was broke and bored. <laughs> I right, great combination, but it really came out of necessity. And most great business ideas come out of necessity, like some sort of need that you have in your own life. And at that time, I was a newlywed living in Philadelphia. I didn't have any family near me. I had just gone through a pretty traumatic death in my family. My father had passed away. Um, I had a lot of student loans, I had a fabulous Ivy League education that cost a lot of money. Um, and so I was in this real sort of inflection point in my life. And I was actually shopping a lot. Um, I, those of you who live in the Philadelphia area, who know the Philadelphia area, you know, the King of Prussia Mall. I was there all the time. My best friend was the guy in the Nordstrom shoe department. And so, well, you know him. <laughs> um, Sorry. you know him too, right? <laughs> like, and so I was just spending a lot of money, um, really as a distraction. And um, my husband at the time mentioned, why don't you start a blog? And I said, well, what is that? Because this was 2002. Um, this was before we really knew what a blog was. No one was really doing that other than people who were super duper into tech. And he said, well, it's like an online diary. You can write about the things you want to buy instead of buying them. And you can kind of almost pretend. And you can talk about your adventures in shopping. Um, and I was like, okay, that sounds great. And so I started writing about all the deals I would find. Um, I'm a trained epidemiologist, so I took a very research-based approach to finding um, discounted shoes um, and designer clothes, and I wrote about it. And for the first six months, um, no one really read it except my mom and my sister-in-law. But then, and this is again about being in the right place, right time. At that time, most reporters um, were really having a difficult time transitioning to the internet. Most publications were. They actually thought in 2003, 2004 that the internet was a fad because no one had quite figured out how to monetize it. And so what many would do when they had to produce content for the web is they would just use what was then new, Google. So Google was a hot new thing in 2002. And so they Googled people who traveled to go budget shopping. And of course, I came up first. Um, and they contacted me. And then the editor from the Associated Press wrote an article. And that article went everywhere because at the time, there wasn't a lot of investment being made in content and online content. So the Associated Press was providing online content for everyone, including the New York Times. So this article about this woman who travels to go, you know, to sample sales in New York, which is about me, became viral and it went everywhere. And my website crashed. This was before the cloud. So we didn't have it scale gracefully. It wasn't any other place to, to put that load. And it kept crashing. We kept fixing it. It kept crashing. We kept fixing it. And that's really how it began. Um, but even then, I didn't see it as a business, ironically, which is crazy. Because, again, there wasn't really many ways to monetize content at that point. Um, and it wasn't until two things happened. One, I got my first book deal. And I was like, wow, somebody wants to read a book about my budget shopping. It was very exciting. <laughs> We're at Random House um, and became one of the first bloggers, especially women bloggers, to ever get a book deal. Um, and it was really interesting because they absolutely did not understand the Internet. Um, and then I got... Uh, I was approached by a new media company called Glam that was looking at ways to monetize particularly lifestyle content. Um, prior to Glam, really there wasn't very many ways to monetize in terms of those display ads we all remember. They didn't really have ones that were fitted fit towards women. Um, they were all about you know tech stuff, and I write about you know discounted Kate Spade shoes. You know it would be kind of weird to have an ad for you know. Uh, a server <laughs> like on the side of it until Glam came along um, and then allowed me to monetize my content quite successfully. Um, and then also at the same time, the, uh, the Today Show approached me about doing a segment on budget shopping, um, which was incredibly fun. I got to spend all day in Marshalls. And so all those things came together. And from a business standpoint, 
it was when I first saw that I could actually monetize this. This what was a hobby can now actually be a business. The challenge was there weren't very many women in the space. So I didn't have very many mentors at that point. Um, not because I didn't want to, because there just wasn't. And that's the challenge when you're very, very early to a space is that you don't necessarily have have the mentors that you need. So I was really cobble, cobbling together like information from different places, um, even in terms of the business model. That makes tons of sense. There's so much in there I want to ask about. And I actually love one of the things you said, like went from being a hobby to actually being a real business. Because I remember one of our ladies who launched events, um, it was, oh gosh, I can't remember her name now, but her company is called Sister Biz. Um, and she said to the audience, if you are not monetizing, that is a hobby and that's okay, but you must be able to find a business model if it's going to work. So quickly to end the story, then you sold it though. And why did you decide to sell it? And, and then kind of lead that into now what you've subsequently done, right? In terms of founding Genius Guild in 2020, like how did you get from there to there? Yeah. So I sold it because I saw things were changing. It was 2009 and it was going for um, more service-based pieces of like, here's how to budget shop to more, look at the clothes I'm wearing. Um, and I realized that I didn't want to take pictures of myself every day. Like <laughs> I just had no desire to, to, that just seemed like enormous amounts of pressure. And so um, I had offers earlier to sell it and Really, at that time, I should have sold it when I had those offers. And that's the thing about being a business owner. It's a lot of it is timing and making sure that your timing kind of matches the market timing. And so I waited. Luckily, the budget fashion was still quite valuable. We had quite a bit of revenue. Um, people obviously had to start budget shopping, except especially post-2008. So it was, and it was this brand and also the actual domain, the website was so old, it had aged and that made it quite valuable. Um, that meant that it would come up, you know, quite, quite quickly and, and on the first page of Google. So I sold it and then I went to go work for another woman like company called Blogger. Um, and Blogger uh, was an amazing startup that serviced over 50 million women who were influencers. That got bought. So it's part of two exits pretty rapidly. And while at Blog Her, I was attending a lot of conferences and noticed that there were no women and no black women. In fact, I went to a Web 2.0 conference in San Francisco. And I remember there was no line for the women's bathroom, but there was a line around the bin for the men's bathroom. And I was like, wow, at least we get something from the patriarchy. We get to like, we get to... We get to pee in peace if that's if that's a plus. But um, and so there really saw this that there wasn't a space for us to gather. And I knew there were women of color in startups, but there just wasn't any place to do that. And so we started Digital Divided, started as a conference, and then went to an incubator in Atlanta, um, and ran that and for eight years, um, and really knew I wanted to transition to something else. Um, Digital Divided originally was a for-profit and we had to transition to a non-profit because companies didn't really see the value in supporting Black women and Latinx women innovators at the time. This is like 2012, 2013. They definitely saw the value of employees who were diverse, but not from an innovation R&D sort of startup standpoint. And so I always knew that I was going to go back to that. Um, and then, of course, you know, 2020 was the inflection point, I think, not just for myself, but for everyone. Um, COVID, I'm a trained epidemiologist, so it was like literally everyone was texting me. And then <laughs> George Floyd's murder, George Floyd um, was murdered about six blocks away from where I went to elementary school. Wow. Minneapolis is my hometown. So it was like, you can imagine all these things were converging. Um, I saw that Black women weren't receiving PPP loans, um, and not just Black women, anyone who wasn't connected and, and didn't have a private banker weren't receiving the first um, wave of those PPP loans. And so started a fund called the Dooney Fund with returned vacation money. Like I was refunded because never going to go on that vacation and used it. And then friends were asking me, it's around my birthday, what do you want for your birthday? 
And of course, we couldn't do anything because we're in the middle of COVID. So I asked them to donate and, and then partners started to donate. And by the end of a six week period, we gave out over $150,000 worth of um, small micro grants um, to over 1,500 black women entrepreneurs. And the power of doing that fundamentally changed my life. Um, because I think sometimes as women, especially as women of color, we forget how powerful we are. We forget that that we can do things. Sometimes we wait and ask for permission um, when we really don't need permission from anyone but ourselves. And so to do that, I didn't ask for permission to do it. I just did it because we're in the middle of COVID. Like, who's going to give me permission? We're all like reeling right then. And it was just so powerful. Um, and that inspired Genius Guild. And it gave me the inspiration to do it, seeing how that micro grant impacted and changed the lives of other black women um, while also changing my life, too. I love that. So I, I always take a little pause when I'm doing um, any sort of keynote or panel conversation. A couple of things I'm certainly learning along the way. I hope you're all taking notes. Number one, timing is everything. I love that you said that when you're talking about selling your, your initial blog. Um, to me, it's also about raise money when you can. Um, that's been the best advice as a former CFO. Someone always talks about the CFO playbook has on the page one, raise money when you can. And you have to get to page 110 before it tells you to do something different. So like for all of you out there, like trying not to be too particular, if money is available, um, I would go get it because growing your business, you're going to look back and don't over worry all the little micro details has to be fair. We can talk about that later in the day, but definitely raise money when you can. I think the second thing that I'm really hearing from Catherine is what I've heard from so many women entrepreneurs over the years doing ladies who launch is so much of their businesses are born out of an experience, something they really fundamentally felt and that power of giving kind of then returns to you. I feel this over and over again. Um, and as you know, we have our launch program as part of Ladies Who Launch. That was born in COVID too, for the same reason. We chatted forever about how we wanted to create a grant program. And then finally I was like, well, no one's going to do it except us. And let's get over the, you know, all of lawyers kept coming up with like reasons why we shouldn't or blah. And we just did it. So launch program's open at the moment too. Okay, you now have though a twenty million dollar venture fund. Um, talk to us about like how that came about. It supports black founders. How do you decide who to invest in? Because everyone on the other side of the screen is thinking, how do I prep my business? Go talk to someone that has money and has a venture fund. So the first thing I always say to entrepreneurs is, don't say no for me. Um, we have a pitch form; it's public pitch. You never know. Um, you, you never know what we may see coming down the pipeline, even though we have sort of three categories in which we invest, which is fintech, um, health and environment, and community platforms. We may have been just at South by Southwest, which we were, <laughs> um, or at another conference and saw a new trend that was coming out, and we may be very interested in it, and your company may feel that. So always pitch, always pitch. Don't worry about us. If we say no, we'll, we'll let you know quickly, but you never know. We might just say yes. Um, and Genius Guild really started because of my work with Digital and Divided and also with the Dooney Fund. Um, one of our venture partners often jokes with me and says that, you know, Digital and Divided was the MVP for Genius Guild. And in many ways it was. Um, I learned a lot about what the challenges were, particularly in the VC space, particularly for people of color, by doing the Project Diane report, um, which really looked at the ability of the availability of venture capital for Black and Latinx women. And the availability was low and it continues to be low. And so it was really inspired by that. Um, we invest in exceptional founders um, who just happen to be Black but they're exceptional founders building amazing companies. Um, and they're building companies that are solving real problems, which I think is also key. One of our companies, um, Health and Her Hue, um, is kind of like WebMD for black women. Um, and they're doing an amazing job. I'm super, super excited for them. They're heading into their, their seed round and is raising quite a significant amount of money. Um, 
Another company we just invested in is called Stimulus, which is a software platform that um, helps corporations better manage their supplier diversity channels. As we all know, the supply chain is very, 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 very much a concern right now. Um, we have another one that I'm just so in love with called Quirk Chat, um, which is a sort of TikTok, TikTok for um, people of color anime enthusiasts. And so we invest in just these exceptional founders. Um, and what I look for in an investor in particular is, are you solving a problem that many other people have? And are they willing to pay for your solution? Um, because if they're not willing to pay for your solution, then again, it's a hobby, right? So, and are they, are they willing to pay for your solution multiple times too? I would add that. So not just once, but they're repeat customers. Um, and and I look for companies and that are building towards that, who are focused on the fundamentals. I think we're in this process where everybody raises, raises, raises. And I do agree, Sarah, you should raise when you can. But also making sure that you have solid business fundamentals, that you have an actual business that you're raising for them is super important as well. To totally agree. Yeah. Don't want to over maybe raise money when you can, but make sure that it's for the right reasons because you can put that money to work with a positive ROI. Um, you, you, I love the focus on the entrepreneurs and I actually think that point about you invest in extraordinary people is really important. I, one of my pet peeves actually when people even inbound to me and they start by saying, I'm looking for a woman, I'm like, okay, I think you got the wrong number. Um, but like that can't be your defining characteristic. I hope you're talking to me because mm -hmm. you think I can be extraordinary at the thing you want me to do. Um, so I actually love that you start with that. Um, but how are you helping bring along investors as well? Like, how are you supporting more investors to get in the game? Yeah. And so we also are LPs and funds as well. It's a very, very small percentage of our portfolio, but I thought it was really important for a number of reasons. One, we've co-invested with a number of our um, funds that we've invested in. It expands our deal flow. And also I need co-investors. You know, if a, if a company is raising a million dollars, I'm not going to write the full million dollar check. So I need co-investors who I trust, um, who I understand their process and their due diligence process to co-invest with. And so um, we've invested in two funds. We're going to be investing in one other one. And that's been quite amazing. And then in terms of the general VC community as a whole and how and how Genius Guild is sort of bringing them along. I always think success is the best mm -hmm. calling card. And what we're bringing along, particularly with a number of the markups, meaning our companies are now worth more than what they, what they were when we invested, I think that's the sort of success that's gonna to start to track um, and that other investors are gonna see. And those who are maybe a little bit shy or leery about investing in diverse entrepreneurs are now gonna be a little bit more open because of our yeah, success. Yeah, and, and there's tons of research that shows, um, certainly I've seen it for um, women non-binary owned businesses. They are great investments. They actually outperform. That part of it is, I think it's so freaking hard to get the money that the sifting system yeah. is tough. So frankly, we should, um, but still it's, um, you know, success should breed success over time. Okay, I want to leave enough time to talk about build the damn thing. So I can't wait to read it. Um, and we're going to have copies of it for our community. So yeah, put your hands up, ladies, um, please let us know. But talk, talk to me a little bit about the book, um, you know, what you cover in it, um, maybe just some of the big takeaways and, you know, in particular, I love the kind of follow on statement, if you're not a rich white man, because we see a lot of that too, right? Hard. Often you're born on second or whatever the base. Is, right. Think you hit a double. Right. And the reality is for the rest of us, we're just still trying to find the ballpark. So it's it's a game. Um, it's we are all on different levels. And the more identities you add to yourself, the higher, the harder the level you're at. Right. And so the book Build a Damn Thing is really all the things I've learned building the damn things <laughs> like, um, as as a woman, as a black woman, as someone from the Midwest. I live in Chicago. Um, and how do you build a company when you have different challenges? And one of the frustrations I had with most business books is that they were written from this perspective of a white male, um, particularly when it comes to entrepreneurship, this perspective that 
people are going to want to see you win and they're going to write you checks and you're going to be able to do all those things. And that's not always the case with us. We have to have some cheat codes is what I like to call them to help us navigate through this space. So for example, you know, for, for me, my family cannot write a check um, to help support me. However, there's other things my family has have done and can do that are actually worth quite a bit of money. Um, when I started Digital Divided, I was living in Atlanta and I couldn't find good childcare for my son. And my mother came to Atlanta, she moved to Atlanta to help me with my son. Now that's not writing me a check for 50K or whatever, but the peace of mind that it saved me, the money that it saved me was quite, quite significant. Um, you know, we all have family members who may have certain skills. Like we have family members who may go to big mega churches, which can be a great place for you to either do customer discovery and or get customers. Maybe they're part of a sorority or a juniors league where you can go and talk to um, and help sell your product or your books. You know, but this rethinking this concept of, of help when your family may not be able to write big checks, but they can help in other ways. It also allows them to be a part of what you're doing. One of the things I found with women and, and people of color entrepreneurs is we often don't bring our families in because we assume either it's going to be a lot for them or they're not going to understand. Our families want to be brought in. They want to be a part of it. When I say family, I'm talking very holistic, not just biological family, but your close friends and things like that. And so I'll talk a lot about that in the book and about preparing yourself emotionally and mentally for entrepreneurship. One of the gaps I've seen in entrepreneurship books is they never talk about the mental toll of entrepreneurship, how lonely it can be. It can be very lonely to be a CEO <laughs> leader of something. Um, and how do you build a team to help you be your best and also the company be their best? Um, I also talk about firing people too, which is something that I get asked a lot from our portfolio companies. No human being enjoys firing people unless you're, I guess, Donald Trump, but, um, but it is a necessity. And how do you do it where you center someone's humanity? Um, and then also talk about building your core values for yourself as well as your company and doing that very, very, very at the very beginning and using your core values to help guide you into decision making. Um, and so it was just such a, so fun writing the book, um, and kind of reminiscing a lot <laughs> about some of the stuff I learned, some of the things you should not do. Um, and, and, and what are the things you should do? And what are some of the things maybe I would have done a little bit differently if I had, um, you know, this knowledge that I have yeah, now? There's, there's so much in there that is immediately hitting me too. Like, I feel, I don't know if it's as a woman, but maybe it's just the type of person. I do feel like sometimes I need to hide the vulnerability side from my family because I already know they worry about me. And so I don't want to tell them something's not going well. Um, you know, but I found in those moments, like I had a, I remember being on vacation, um, but I was trying to raise money. It's actually when I just joined next door and we we're trying to do that first raise. And I'd had, you know, I'd, I, investors always tell you they're going to invest right up to the last minute because what they're doing is keeping their options open. I got, you know, we're right, right ready. I'm like, okay, I've corralled. It's like literally like, you know, herding cats to get them all into the same place. And this, I got on the phone. I was like, okay, ready to go. Like, you know, here's my bank account. Send the money. And the guy was like, uh, duh. and he was like, no. And you know, I kind of put down the phone. I was like starting to cry. It was like so ridiculous because um, I was so hurt. Actually, it was, wasn't even just the money. It was just I was really hurt. And my husband walked in and he was so taken back. He's like, oh, my God, like what happened? You never cry. And it made me realize how much I hide that side of myself. And yet yeah. you're so right when you said the mental toll. That's the mental toll of having to be this constantly upbeat person for everyone. So finding outlets for it, because there are places like you, you can't probably let too much of it out in the middle of like a driving startup because you're keeping everyone else motivated. But I love that you went there first. And I think, too, vulnerability as a leader is a strength. And I think a lot of times it's not positioned as such because we still are in such a male dominated space. But like letting your team know 
Um, and maybe not all the details, but letting your team, your family, others know when you have a challenge, it humanizes you to them. Um, and they want you to win. And, and that's the thing that I think can be hard is to realize that you have people on your team, people who want you to win. Your family wants you to win. Um, your community wants you to win. I want you to win. <laughs> we all want you to win. And so showing a little vulnerability allows us to help you. And allows us to feel part of your story too. So we always end every Ladies Who Launch panel or keynote with one question. Like, what is the one thing you want everyone listening right now to do in the next week? So it has to be like doable and very real time. Oh gosh. I would like everyone to take five minutes and just be quiet. Don't look at your phone. Don't talk to anyone. Um, go on if you uh, if you're a mom and you have kids, go in your closet, find a but five minutes and not do anything. I, I love that. I almost want to take it right now. You don't sit here. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, ladies, you heard it. Five minutes of just complete you time, silence, take a pause. Um, Catherine, so much amazing advice in there. Timing is everything. Don't say no for me. Give to get back. The mental toll of entrepreneurship. I've been trying to take some notes as I go, but I hope everyone out there is taking notes. Um, thank you for all that you've done to advance this field to support entrepreneurs. Thanks for kicking our day off with such an inspiring and energizing call to action. Let's go build the damn thing. Uh, so with that, we are going to pass the baton over. Please stay with us for today. Um, and we're going to tap into programs that offer capital and community around the world. So move on to the next session. I hope you have a really productive day. And of course, all of this content will be available on our Launch Academy as well. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you.